Welcome everybody. This is the Koji podcast, and um, I'm joined. Well, I'm I'm the co-host here, but uh, you know, I thought I'd introduce us today. You know, for a change. This is my my supreme host, the greatest, strongest biceps. Um, you know, really good kickboxer. Maybe not the best wrestler, just because you know he's bigger than me, but he can't pin me down. It's it's crazy. I know. Uh, it, it baffles the mind, really. I mean. That I can just submit him so many. Oh, sorry, sorry. I was going off on a tangent. Oh, but um, the point is, here he is, the great, the beautiful, <laughs> Saul Espinosa. Welcome to my home. Thank you. Thank you for introducing my podcast. <laughs> just I forgot to mention, my name is David Espinosa. <laughs> How are you doing, David? I'm doing good. How are you doing? You look really tired. I am very tired. Why? What? What? What happened yesterday? That was very. Um... I was up all night. I will not <laughs> disclose anything. Okay. It is to remain private. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, thank you. Uh, <laughs> so the podcast is self-defense, Catholic mis- masculinity. Um, let's get into it. The story of how the First Crusade succeeded is filled with personal acts, sorry, personal heroics, sacrifice, and miraculous interventions throughout the journey. The real story has been obscured by the sensationalism and Hollywood history of our time. And the story should be set straight. Those who entered the city in that, in that summer of 1099, or 1099, AD, whatever, endured three years of battle starvation and disease in order to complete their armed pilgrimage at the sep- at the holy sepulcher of the lord 80% of their brothers in arms who marched from europe with them were dead missing or had deserted that's 80% of all <laughs> of all the men that set out on the crusades were dead those who those few who remained who remained succeeded in comp- accomplishing the task given to them by Pope Urban II. In the fall of 1095, the liberation of Jerusalem, the warriors of the First Crusade left the comfort of their homes and loved ones at the urging of Urban II. In November 1095, Urban preached the First Crusade at a church council at Claremont. He called upon the warriors of Christendom to liberate the Holy Sepulchre of the Lord in Jerusalem and to stop the persecution of Holy Land Christians and Muslim harassment of Christian pilgrims from the West. Urban then traveled throughout France, exhorting warriors to take the cross and participate in the armed pilgrimage. It is estimated that 60,000 warriors responded to Urban's call and made preparations to leave for the Holy Land. These warriors were organized into four main arm, army groups, commanded by Hugh of Vermandois, or whatever, the younger brother of Philip I of France, Raymond of Tolaus, or how you, however you pronounce that, Godfrey de Bouillon, and the well-known warrior Bohemond. Uh, the groups left Europe separately and traveled overland to Constantinople, where they encountered Emperor Alexius I. Alexius was less than enthusiastic at their arrival and feared that they would try to overthrow him. After receiving assurances, the Christian warriors were more interested in liberated Jerusalem. Alexius transported the groups to Anatolia to begin the march to the holy city. After liberating Nicaea, the crusader armies began the long march through Anatolia on their way to their second objective, Antioch. The, cru- the Crusaders embarked on what became known as the Anatolian Death March during the summer heat. Food and water were scarce, and horses died in droves. Men even died of hypothermia. Sorry, no. <laughs> Hy- hyponatremia, whatever, water intoxication. After drinking, <laughs> hypothermia is one, it's cold. After drinking too much water too fast, when resources were found, Count Raymond of Talaus became so ill 
that facing sorry, that fearing death was near, he received the sec sacrament of extreme unction. Adding to their suffering on the march, the crusaders were attacked by an allied Muslim force near the town of Dor Dorileum. Despite their weakened condition, the Christian warriors fought well and under the leadership of Bohemond, defeated the Muslim army. News of the victory spread throughout the region and contributed to the belief that the Christian force was invincible. After the grueling four-month march through Anatolia, the Crusaders arrived at the ancient Christian city of Antioch, where they settled in for a long siege. Antioch was a heavily defended city with a massive wall, and the Crusader force was too small to, to fully encircle the city. The siege wore on, and as casualties mounted, the city was eventually breached through a plan concocted by Bohemond, who successfully bribed one of the tower guards to allow the Crusaders' entry into the city unmolested. Although the Crusaders were in control of the city, the citadel remained in Muslim hands, or that is the arm, the main armory of the city. Um, you know, it's something you know that it's like the last defense of the city. Um, and um, yeah, a large, a large. Uh, so not only was was the citadel still in the hands of the Muslims, but a large Muslim army, relief army under the command of. Kerboga, Kerboga, caught between the Muslim, sorry, uh, arrived at the walls. The Christian warriors were caught between the Muslim-held citadel inside the city and the large Muslim army outside the walls. The long siege was costly and the morale was exceptionally low. Many believed this was the end of the crusade. And this is, the, this is the, where it really gets good. But God intervened and morale was restored when the relic of the Holy Lance, the spearhead used by St. Longinus, uh, to pierce the Lord's side as he hung on the cross, was found in a church after the layman Peter Bartholomew received visions about its uh, location. Emboldened by the finding of the relic, the Crusaders launched a surprise offensive on the Muslim ar relief army outside the walls of Antioch. Veterans of the battle recalled seeing angels and the spirits of, the, of dead crusaders riding into combat with the living. The crusaders were exhausted after the, their miraculous victory over a numerically superior foe and spent the next several months rest, resting and preparing for the assault on Jerusalem. The remnant of the First Crusade armies arrived 12,000 strong at the city walls of Jerusalem on June 7, 1099. They spent the next days, the next six days, building their siege camp and reconnoitering um, the defenses of the city. After failed attacks, the situation was desperate as news of the Fatimid relief army on on the march reached the Crusader camp. The Crusaders were now engaged in a race against time. The siege was saved when a priest, Peter Desiderius, shocked the warriors with an announcement that he had seen a vision of Bishop Ad Adhemar, Adhemar, the papal legate, leg legate, legate who had died shortly after the final victory at Antioch. According to his testimony, Adhemar was upset at the lack of unity among the crusade leaders and indicated the holy city could fall only with a show of penance by the crusaders. He demanded that they fast for three days, and then process barefoot and unarmed around Jerusalem. On July, 9, on July 8th, the Christian host processed around the holy city singing prayers and bearing relics, including the holy lands from Antioch. The Muslim defenders mocked the crusaders' imitation of Joshua and the Israelites at Jericho, by hanging crosses over the walls while, while hitting and abusing them. A week later at 3 p.m., the hour of the crucifixion, the crusaders achieved their final objective and entered the holy city of Jerusalem. Much has been made of the massacre of Jerusalem after the crusaders entered the city. While it is true that the crusaders killed thousands in the city, combatants and non-combatants, tens of thousands were captured, ransomed, or fled. The dictates of warfare at the time, followed by Christians and Muslims alike, allowed victorious siege armies free 
free reign once the city fell. This is why many cities accepted a conditional surrender when armies first appeared at the walls. And then it just talks about how after this first crusade, this first victory, um, while many of the soldiers returned to the land, um, there was a smaller portion who stayed to watch over, uh, watch over Jerusalem. Uh, they wanted to appoint a king, so they found one of the most, uh, or maybe the most eligible defender uh, of Jerusalem, but he didn't accept the title. He instead, um, he, he rejected uh, the title of king, it says right here, and he instead chose the defender of the Holy Sepulcher. And, um, and something that's really cool is that it says that he refused to wear a crown of gold in the city where his Savior wore a crown of thorns. And that's the article given by uh, Stephen Weidenkopf, who I believe has a book called The Glory of the Crusades. You can find this on Catholic Answers. It's called The Real Story of the First Crusade. <laughs> This is something that's missing in our times. <laughs> no, no, but seriously, this is something that's that we've lost in our times. The the thought of of true masculinity. Yes. <clears throat> because really, you know, especially in today's times where tos they talk about toxic masculinity that we have to get rid of it or whatever. Well. When they actually t tell you what they think toxic masculinity is, they're just explaining masculinity, true masculinity. They want to get rid of masculinity. But in fact, we need more of that. We get pumped with testosterone. <laughs> just like the Crusaders did. We need to have the heart of a Crusader, the heart of a Cristero. And um, just like for people who think that, you know, like they say, oh, I'm a lover, not a fighter, you know? It's like, well, if you truly love, then you're going to fight for it. Yeah. If you don't love, I mean, if you don't fight for what you love, then you don't truly love it. Exactly. You, you, you show your love by action, not merely by, by words. Yeah, I mean, well, what kind of a man are you if, if your family's getting assaulted somehow and you don't fight, you know? Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm going to call the police. Like, what? No, <laughs> you're the first line of the defense. You know, how long is it going to take for the police to get here? You know, it's like, it's, it's your job. It's yeah. your job. And so it, uh, a lot of times we talk, we've been talking a lot about like domestic church, right? We're supposed to be the heads of households and, you know, like the protector defender, you know, we talk about that a lot. But um, I think a lot of people are like, well, I'm not thinking about getting married soon or whatever. So, you know, I'm just going to live my life. Do It's like, you're a man, you know, hey, what's the life, what's life for, you know? Yeah, the yeah the because life. Because they're of... just like, oh, you know, I'll just do whatever I want, and then when I grow up, when I you know, <laughs> when I'm thirty, when I need to change, then I'll change. You know. Yeah, no. But that's the thing is that you need to change now. It's just like that. You know, I was I, I was talking to you about Jordan Peterson. I don't remember exactly how it goes, but he was saying, um, "Are worth fighting for." You know, there are things that are worth fighting for, and we need to be willing to take a risk. But and we know it's a risk because there's a danger, but it's more dangerous if we choose to stay where we're at, you know. Yeah. Because like if if life is like a race, if you just stop there, then you're gonna get disqualified. You know, you're gonna get eliminated from the race. You have to keep on going, keep on, um, getting better. Um, wait, what? <laughs> time before that. you're saying something before. That. Well, just just that like. Like the that's the life of man, right? Is <laughs> like you are protector and defender, you know, mm -hmm. to the best of your ability, yeah, and, to, and to anybody around you. Yeah, it's not you know because people think, oh well, I'm not married, so you know, I have no responsibility. But those around you that you love, those you know, you have some sort of responsibility over them. Obviously, not the same that you would have as a husband or father, but still, to yeah, some degree. I mean, I mean, what if somebody you know assaults like your mom, or you know what I mean? Or what if? What if they don't have one? Well, I mean, look, it, look, you, you, you at, look, look, it, it, it not only like being being fit or whatever and doing exercise doesn't only, 
fit into like defending it also and, and protecting it also fits into like basic things like helping your family carry heavy things you know mm -hmm. like if your mom can't carry this insanely heavy uh, box of books or something uh, maybe you know you should you should work out so you could be able to help her more <laughs> yeah no and also because you know how there's like people that's like oh he wouldn't know how to fly he's so gentle and so well, basically weak you know the, the you know so soft or whatever but you you can't really say that about someone that's weak because they don't they can't they don't have the ability to do something so bad they just don't have, you know they don't have the ability for it the strength for it yeah but when someone is actually strong and knows how to be dangerous and they choose not to be you know not not to use it for the wrong yeah and that's true meekness and that that shows that they have true power and uh control over themselves yeah and and uh something that sticks out cuz i do want to bring the article that we just read in to the discussion is how how um how sorry i forgot his name his name Steve is Biden cop no, 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 no. How at at the end of the article when it talks about Godfrey the the Boyon, however, however you pronounce his name, uh, you know he 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 didn't want to be a king. He wanted to be a defender of the the Holy Sepulcher. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So so when we talk about uh, men being heads of households, you know, we're not talking about a lazy king. You know what I mean? Who just <laughs> just trying to pleasure himself. Exactly, he exactly, exactly, and and. Uh, when when the, the king the true like the true connotation of king should be defender, protector, head like main servant, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know what I mean, like uh, and at the head of it so that he can, that he can uh, guide everyone to safety. You know what I mean? They guide everyone on the good path of life, on a good virtuous life, and um, and uh, like like you were saying, a lot of people you know they prefer. Um, I don't think women really prefer dating guys like that. Maybe they could trick themselves into thinking that. But uh, for sure, a lot of, like, <laughs> like you know, grandmas at church or something, like, oh, he's a nice boy, you know, he's he wouldn't hurt anyone or whatever. It's like, <sighs> he has to be tough, mm -hmm. you know? Like, St. Saint, Saint John, Saint John Vianney, maybe he was, he, he wasn't really, he was actually, um... He was enlisted in the army at one point, but, you know, there's a whole story behind that, which we can't get into now, but it's really interesting. Um, but he wasn't, a, you know, he wasn't really a soldier type person, but he was still self-sacrificing, you know, mm -hmm. in every way. Like he, he would, uh, when he was cur curé of ours, he would fast for for um, his, what do you call it? Not congregation, right? Or I guess you could just say that. I don't know. He, he would fast for, for his spiritual family. You know what I mean? He would... He would sleep so little, you know, like he just gave everything of himself. Mm -hmm. And so anyways, so that's the true, um, you know, instead of defender of the Holy Sepulchre, um, you know, you could be defender of basically whoever's in your life. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And, um, yeah, and, and I think that sort of segues that, that is a good person. Mm -hmm. That is a good man. Not the man who hasn't, hasn't, um. Who never gets his hands dirty, you know, to help people. And anyways, that's all I wanted to say. <laughs> yeah. And I think that sort of segues us into, like, you know those those Catholic moms or grandmas or whatever, where they're like, you know, you know, they, they you know, want to teach their kids the faith and everything, but then on one, ha one hand they're like, oh, but I don't want them to be tough, you know, their kids to be tough or, or rough, I mean. Yeah, yeah. And they don't want them to learn how to fight. They don't want them to you know, do certain hard things, they want to sort of shelter them. Or sometimes they might even say, start making like arguments that self-defense is, you know, a sin is something. a sin because you're hurting each other or you're learning how to hurt someone or something like that. And that sort of gets us into, I guess, self-defense, right? What the church teaches about self-defense. Um, we, we're going to get this information from the Baltimore Catechism uh, 3. So the question is, what does the fifth commandment forbid? The fifth fifth commandment being, uh, "Thou shalt not kill," right? Which also brings in, you know, which also means you, you know, "Thou shalt not hurt someone," you know, physically. But uh, to quote, the fifth commandment forbids murder and suicide, and also fighting, anger, hatred, revenge, drunkenness, and a bad example. A, bird murder is the voluntary and unjust killing of a human being. 
It is a serious crime because it is an infringement on the right of God's dominion over human life and is an irreparable injustice to the victim, to his family, and to society. See how it says, notice how murder is defined by saying it is the unjust killing of a human being, not just the killing of, an, of a human being. And that distinction is very uh, necessary because then people start saying, oh, well, you know, that means the, the capital punishment is a sin too. But there are authorities given by God, right? All authority in the world is given by God. And the, you know, the law enforcement does have authority over people. That's why they're, you know, they're allowed to do, the, the church allows them to do, uh, to follow through with uh, the death sentence. Well, yeah, and, and just, just, you know, in police work, right? If somebody's not complying, then, you know, I mean, if they're not complying, then what if they're getting a gun? You know what I mean? Yeah. Th they have the right to, to um, you know, force themselves upon people with good reason anyways. And that was... Or when someone's going to hurt your family, you're not going to just stand there and say, well, I can't hurt him, you know? I can't kill him. Yeah, I've heard, so, I've heard Doug Berry talk about that, that he was talking with, I don't know, one of his friends, or I don't know who, and he's like, what if somebody broke in, in you know, in the middle of the house, in the middle of the night, and... And, you know, you know, I guess he had daughters or whatever. Like, what would you do? Mm -hmm. I would pray. Or I don't know. I forgot what his response was, but he's like, I don't know. You know what I mean? Like, like <laughs> it, his, his first response was not, oh, I'm going to, like, basically throw myself, sacrifice, sacrifice myself if I have to, but obviously you fight smart. Well, here's the thing is that I think I know what you're talking about, but he was, I think, or maybe we're talking about two different scenarios. I mean, different. Or maybe I'm remembering. One, one that he was talking about that I think I want to bring up is, like, he was saying, you know, man, would you die for your family? I mean, sorry, would you fight for your family? They're like, yeah. Would you die for your family? Yeah. He was like, well, but the best, you know, thing is that you don't die, right? <laughs> that you still defend them, but you don't die. And to do that, you got to train, you know? And it, we had to take it upon ourselves as men to train for this, how to fight, how to protect. Because uh, we're basically saying, yeah, I'm willing to do it. I just don't know how. You know, and that's okay if you don't know how. That's how you go learn. You know, but that this also brings us into. So now we know that there's a just killing of human being and unjust, right? So, um, this takes us to be the. I mean, to yeah, sorry. The life of another person may lawfully be taken, first, in order to protect one's own life or that of a neighbor, or a, a serious amount of possessions from an unjust aggressor. Provided no other means of protection is effective. Second, by a soldier fighting a just war. And third, by a duly appointed executioner of the state when he meets out a just punishment for a crime. Uh, e. The human body may not be mutilated unless there is no other way to preserve the health or to save the life of a person. F. It is sinful to take life without sufficient reason. To risk one's life in order to save the life of another person is permissible and in certain cases obligatory. And H. One may, may never take part in a duel which is prearranged, a prearranged contest between two persons with deadly weapons. The church punishes with excommunication not only those who engage in a duel, but those who assist them and even those who are deliberately present at a duel and do not as far as they can try to prevent it. Yeah, I mean... I, I just want to say that it's 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 interesting like the, it's so concise. I mean, it, it makes the distinguish, the the distinct distinction that it's a prearranged contest. You know what I mean? So I I assume like if somebody <laughs> has a gun or whatever and and um, I don't know I don't know where you are in the scenario, but you know, you guys get in some sort of uh, conflict not not begun by you but by the other person, then you have to be ready to like. <laughs> So like seriously wound this guy, you know, because he has a he has a gun, and you don't know what the heck is gonna happen. But anyways, that's all prudential stuff. But the the point is that it doesn't talk about boxing or anything like that. The point is that that this is athleticism. You know what I mean? In distinction, in, you know, and it's it's um, it, uh, boxing is different than a duel. You know what I mean? Where where the goal is actually probably to kill each other. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh yeah, because in boxing that's not the that's not the point. It's the point. The point is to get more points. <laughs> you know, it's not to to kill the other person. That's not the intention. And 
I mean, great great care that's should be says, taken. Here. It is sinful to risk one's own life without sufficient reason. Yeah, you know? exactly. That's why there's referees. That's why there's this and that, you know? Um, and that's why it's up to the boxer and his prudential judgment. If he's like, okay, I've taken enough damage. I need to get out, you know? Then he made the right decision. But if he stays and he ends up dying, that that's pretty much on him because he decided to stay there to take the beating, you know? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different things that can happen in, in each scenario, but... But like, but for sure, like sparring, because I know, like, like if if a lot of like uh, moms at church or whatever they, they see like boys sparring, like, oh no, oh uh, what's happening? Oh, like if they're witnessing some sort of murder or something, you yeah. know what I mean? I mean, it, here's the thing: it is a natural reaction for women to react that way. Yeah, yeah. Towards fighting, because that's not you know where they're in, that's not where they're inclined towards you know as men are, but especially as a mother of sons. She has to sort of, you know, sort of bring her worry meter down, you know, on that. Because if, if by them boxing, by them doing these things, they're, you know, expressing their masculinity. They're learning how to control themselves in how they fight, you know, and how, you know, and how much power they can put, how much power they can restrain. And that's very important for a man. Yeah, it's all, about, it's all about restraint. Because in order to be a good boxer, you have to, like, not eat junk food you have to you have to subject subject your body to like uh really like grueling exercises and and cardio <laughs> you know what i mean it's not easy to be a to be a good boxer you know what i mean and and that that teaches a lot of lessons in life and for men that, that's that's something that that um that, that's men learn, learn way differently than women you know uh and there's also humility involved you know you can think that you're really good, but if you didn't train, you know, you might have a big ego, but maybe your skills and your cardio or, or your strength doesn't fit your ego. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, so there's a lot of good lessons in boxing, but my, my only point is that that, um, that boxing wouldn't be against the fifth commandment. Yeah. Know? And it's something actually good for men to learn, not only for defense, but also for self-control. For you know, subjecting their bodies, it's I, I suppose you can see it's like a form of penance, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, especially some some, you know, when when you're when you're running or whatever, and so you can't run anymore. When you're punching a bag, so you can't punch it anymore. You know, you're doing you're doing uh, you're kind of beating up your body in a sense. You know, it's it's a good penance. Um, uh, obviously, that's not the only penance that you should do. But yeah. and uh, one more thing I want to say on that is that a lot of people will say that. That, you know, that's just one aspect of a man or whatever. Mm. You know, like, what about everything else, you know? It's like, that's a, that, yeah, I mean, it's one pe aspect, I suppose, but it's a really important one. Mm -hmm. That Which you should, they shouldn't, the rest. yeah, we're, exactly, exactly, like, yeah, like, like, they, they'd rather focus on other things, like, I mean, like, knowing your faith, that's the most important, right? And, and pr your prayer life, that's also the most important and just doing your duties of state in life, but if you're not physically capable to do, do your duties of life, uh, of, of your state in life, then what is that? <laughs> no, yeah. You, and, need, you and need to also, build the natural structure also, first. Like, you should have to ask girl, like, okay, would you want a guy that could fight for you and actually be able to, you know, have an effect on the other person, like, be able to, you know, stand his ground or someone who's going to sh shell up and just, you know, yeah. you know, be all scared and everything? Because that also reflects... On so much in his life, not just fighting other other guys or anything, because when you fight, you get that confidence. Well, actually, we're gonna talk about that later, but um, it's just really important for men, and I think it's essential for men to know uh, to be physically capable of yeah. defending. And, then, and also, I wanted to just point out where it says right here, um, you know, that one of the the scenarios where it wouldn't be bad to kill or sinful to kill is by a soldier fighting a just war and that's important because you know if it's an unjust war and you're killing all these people then right there you're committing sin you know yeah. that's why you got to be careful especially about joining the army <laughs> you know especially during these times and you know what well, at all times there's unjust wars and i think you got to make sure, like, just because it's the army doesn't mean it's good, you know? Obviously, you want to be able to protect your country, but if they're doing wrong, then you can't, you can't, uh, 
Yeah, I mean, I'm sure. That. I'm sure there's instances in history where, where um. I mean, I there's there's people well, who refused to fight like with the Nazis. Like, in Germany. Yeah, exactly. There you go. I don't know the whole story. I don't even remember the guy's name, but I, there's a really cool story on that. Um, and now we go to. I guess the Catholic morality. If you, I don't know if you've seen the book. Uh, especially a lot of Catholic homeschoolers have this, where it's called Catholic Morality. Um, and I'm just going to read through it real quick. So, quote, Thou shall not kill. Capital punishment inflicted by the state after conviction of a criminal is not murder. In the Old Testament, God himself delegated his supreme right over life to his creatures. Whoever sheds human blood, let his blood be shed. In the New Testament, the officer of the law is called by St. Paul the minister of God, and is said, without cause to carry the sword. And the sword of the symbol is a symbol of the power to inflict death. Because uh, <clears throat> obviously there can be capital punishment that is unjust. It's a case by case thing. Like St. Paul, he was killed by the state, <laughs> you know? Exactly. That was obviously very sinful of them, killing a saint, making a martyr. And the pun the punishment should... Uh, be equal to the crime, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So if somebody stole a little candy bar, <laughs> you know, they shouldn't be... I'm sure stuff like that happens in, like, no. communist China yeah. or whatever. <laughs> no, and here's the thing is that the reason why the state ha is the one that should do it and not you is because, especially with emotions and having it been done to you, you can go overboard. And, you, and also the intention will be for revenge on yourself, you know? But when it's the state, like, they weren't the ones hurt. You know, so they could clearly, rationally think about this, and you wouldn't be culpable for any of the, you know, whatever decision they make. Um, so that's, that's just something I want to say. And then four, oh, sorry, continuing quote: He does not commit a sin who kills another in self-defense. I may repel an unjust aggressor, anyone who has no right to threaten my life, even at the cost of his life under certain conditions. So what are the conditions? The conditions are, a that I use no greater violence than is necessary to ward off danger to my own life. B. That I inflict violence on the aggressor during the very act of aggression, neither before nor after. C. They have no other means such as flight or calling for help of avoiding danger. And D. That I do not directly intend the death of the aggressor, but only the defense of my own life. Um... Yeah, I think this is very necessary because I feel like people, they don't know all the conditions that need to be met with self-defense because they could go to one extreme or the other. Yeah, like um, there are there are times when it's the the person, although they do have they 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 do have um, they they should have righteous anger, you know, when something has been done against them. Uh, it's not their role to go kill them unless they're being. Uh, I mean, if someone does something bad to them or someone they or bad to something someone they love, right? Yeah, exactly. So, so I mean, yeah, you have to use your prudence there. Like, what if like <laughs> you find him or whatever, and you know, if you call the police, maybe maybe you know that they won't. I don't know. You have to use your prudence. The point is that it's not your role; it's the, the role of the state. You know what I mean? You can't just go be Batman. <laughs> well, Batman doesn't kill, but yeah, no, and also it's important because. You know how people want to do revenge or whatever? You, so even after the whole thing happened, they want to go and seek out revenge, you know? And that's after the fact. At that point, at that point, it's stuck. It's, the, you know, the state's problem, you know? But when it was, if you were somehow able to stop it at the time, then obviously you had to do something. And if the, only, the last means of stopping them is killing them, then so be it, you know? Um... So yeah, but obviously if, if you're able to uh, to run away or able to escape with the person that they're hurting or if you're able to avoid the danger, then do so. Don't be looking for a fight because you're gonna get you're gonna find one for sure. And yeah, and, and the, the your your intention shouldn't be to kill the person. It should be to defend yourself. And that's important because once you realize that, then. Um, then if you kill them, you're not, you're not going to have that. Obviously, you're going to be angry at them, but not like a... Uh, well, I don't know how to explain it exactly. I don't know. Like, I guess... Uh, 
like a sinful anger. You know what I mean? I don't know. I mean, um, I mean, yeah, I mean, okay. Because to feel the emotion of anger and to act on it, those are two different things, you know. And you act on it, it's going to be a mortal sin if you kill a guy, you know. Especially if you weren't in danger of dying, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, that's all I have to say about that. Okay. Uh, so continue. But has one right a right to kill in defense of other goods besides life? If there be no other means of defending material goods of great importance, the possessor has the right to take the life of the robber who attempts to deprive him of them or to retain them. For unjust attacks upon one's reputation or good name, the right of self-defense obviously does not extend so far as taking the life, no, taking, the taking of the calumniator's life. There are other and more effectual means of redress. A woman has the right to defend her virtue by taking the life, if need be, of the aggressor. One who threatens a woman's honor not only violates her right to personal integrity, but also her right of natural independence. So what it means by virtue, it's just saying like, um, basically if someone's trying to rape her, then she has the right to kill them. Yeah. That's yeah. what I mean. Yeah, how are you going to say that? She doesn't have the right to kill him. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. No, yeah, yeah, definitely. And also, um, no, yeah, because obviously we're not saying like, okay, because so, some, with some people, they get so mad if someone just, you know, uh, says something bad about their wife and they're like, I have to beat him up or something. But that's not right, you know. It's only if it's something like this where he's going to rape her and the only means of getting rid of him is by killing him, you know. Mm-hmm. Um... Now, the killing of animals is not murder, as some fanatics claim. Animals have no rights. They are no, not intelligent and free. If they had rights, they would also have duties. But no one will say that they have duties. But to deny that animals have rights is certainly not saying that we may treat them according as our fancy moves us. God made them and has rights in them. So we have a duty to, not, to God to not, mis- not to mis- misuse them. Uh, I think we'll stop right there for now. So this is part one. And in the next podcast, we're going to talk about the reasons to learn a martial art. You know, the all the the benefits. And then also the warrior mentality. Um, so thank you for watching this podcast. I uh, hope you liked it. Uh, comment, subscribe. Yeah, please like, thank- share, comment, subscribe. Thank you for Thank you for being here, viewer. We really appreciate you individually. Yes, we do. We we love you. I'm <laughs> Bless no. you, <emotion. laughs> David. Can you please give us a blessing? Ah. Neil, okay. I'll give you a blessing. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Dominic, please. <laughs> All right. All right, God guys. Bless. <laughs>